This morning I'm going to be talking again about our incredible body's ability to heal itself and how it will heal itself when it's given the right conditions. So then the million dollar question is asked, how does it heal? How does the body heal itself? What are the what is the inside story in how we heal? Now we have a situation happening on planet Earth at the moment and every single person on the planet is affected by this. And we are told that the best way, and have always been told, to resist colds, flus, is to have a strong immune system. Is that right? A strong immune system. Whether a person believes in treating this medically or whether they believe in treating it naturally, all agree that we need a strong immune system. And so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to show you what that immune system is. But before I do, I'd like to ask you a question and you certainly don't need to answer, ask yourself this question, do you know what your immune system is? We should know something about the house we live in. And in Proverbs 14 verse 6, the Bible says, A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy to him that understands. When you understand what the immune system is, then it is not hard to determine how to treat it, how to encourage it, how to discourage it, what helps it, what hurts it. When we understand that, then we will have a strong immune system. And I'd like to begin by sharing a quote with you from one of my favorite authors, her name's Ellen White. And this is from one book she wrote called um, Christ Objects Lesson. It's paid, found in uh, 347. Transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. For God is as truly the author of the physical law as he is of the moral law. God has written his law with his own finger on every nerve, every muscle, every faculty with which we have been entrusted. And every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. All should become intelligent as to the human frame. How many? All. <laughs> All should become intelligent as to the human frame and how to keep it in the condition necessary to do the work of the Lord. The relation that exists between the physical organism and the spiritual life is one of the most important branches of education and I'd like to add one of the most neglected. The physical organism should be carefully preserved and developed. Now there's two things there. The physical organism should be carefully preserved, but that's not enough. And developed. And then the author says why? That through humanity, the divine nature might be revealed in all of its fullness. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Seeing then that we accompanied, we encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are the witnesses? The witnesses are the rest of our family. Aren't they our witnesses? Our neighbours? Uh, our workmates? Uh, our, our relatives? The people we see at the shop? Uh, I've got some friends I see about once every five years. Now let's go outside the planet. Other worlds, angels, they're all watching. They're all watching. You, you cannot hide. You could go to one of those mountaintops. I saw some snow this morning, did you? It's exciting for me, I don't see snow. <laughs> Even living up on a little hut, <laughs> we've still got witnesses. Now I want to come back, 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 come back to planet Earth. Now come back to the body. There are some other witnesses. There's your cells. Let's go right inside the body. There's your cells. Your hair is an illustration of how you live, 
how you eat, the laws you adhere to, our teeth, our eyes, our ears. Let's go inside our heart. We looked at heart health last night. Our pancreas under your left rib. We looked at pancreatic health last night when we looked at diabetes. Your liver, earlier in the week we looked at our liver. Do you know where your liver is? Some people say to me, I've got a sore tummy. There's no tummy down there, it's up here. <laughs> your diaphragm, your muscles, your bones. They are witnesses. They are witnesses as to the life you're leading. Remember, God has written his law with his own finger on every nerve, every muscle, every faculty with which we have been entrusted. And every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. And the violation of that law is quickly seen in disease, is quickly seen in a compromise of our immune system. So let's go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that's a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us run with patience the race set before us. Now I'm going to go a little bit closer to the health of the body and we're going to look at the race. And the race is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 starting at about verse 24. Know you not that they that run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. It's referring to the Olympic Games. Actually, in the Bible, it was referring to the Greek games, which is where the Olympic games we know now come from. Know you not that they that run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize. Therefore, so run that you might receive. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. I love watching the Olympic games. I think most do because I love excellence and we all love excellence. Have you seen the training program that they go through. And the best from every country is at the Olympic Games. The best. And what they go, go through, the trials. Whoa, got through that trial. Whoa, got through that trial. And finally picked to go to the Olympic Games. And then, we, then they go to the Olympic Games and they're, they're competing against the best in every country. Every man that strives for the mastery. What's the mastery? The mastery over this body. I'm sure that young man that played that beautiful violin, he has to master. <laughs> he has to master that by going over it and over it. And I'm sure there was a lot of practice before he stood here. Everyone that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. These Olympic athletes, they cannot afford a late night. They can afford to go one day without training. They, can afford, they cannot afford not to be well hydrated. They cannot aff afford to take drugs or alcohol, no, no, no. They can't do anything that would impair or compromise their performance. <clears throat> And receives the prize, only one. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, we an incorruptible. <laughs> What's that incorruptible crown? What, weren't they beautiful songs? Some of those songs I've not heard before. I want to search them out, they're nice. <laughs> Talking about that glory land. In this race, everyone can win even the lame, even the weak. <laughs> they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Do you know what that crown was at the time when he, Paul, the author, wrote this? It was a, a wreath that had been, been woven out of vines and it was very corruptible. In fact, by the end of the day, the leaves were wilting. <laughs> they went to all that for this. Well, it's the honour too. The whole village was, was honoured from, you know, of the man or the woman that won that race. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, but not as uncertainly. 
They run uncertainly because they don't know if they're going to win. But we do. <laughs> I therefore so run, but not as uncertainly. So fight I, but not as one that beats the air. I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection. If by any means when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. So let's have a look at this body. Now notice the first part of Christ's objects lesson. It said transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. You can't be guilty of breaking law if you don't know what the law is. Let me quickly write these physical laws. Pure air. There's the oxygen. <clears throat> the most powerful way to oxygenate our body is exercise. I exercise every day. I'm training for something more important than the Olympic Games. Hmm? So how much more effort should I put into it? I exercised this morning, oh yes. I had to wait till quarter past six so I could see where I was going. <laughs> I heard movement in the bushes. Ah, dear. I needed to oxygenate my body and I'm so happy that where I walk there's the pine trees. They give off more oxygen than even other trees. I, d I breathed in very, very deeply. It's one of the laws. The third law is sunshine. Haven't been able to get much of that. There are some people here getting a lot right now. <laughs> Need your sun hat on. <laughs> Four is temperance. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, we an incorruptible. Not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things. The fifth law is rest. I had to go to bed early last night. There is a formula. If you abide by the formula, the body, the brain works. I had to go to bed early. I had to get my eight hours. My favourite, nine to five. Six. Proper diet. These are the physical laws. When we break these laws, every single cell in the body knows it. Genesis 1.29 tells us, God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth. And every tree, and the which of the trees are fruit bearing seed. There's your grains, there's your nuts, there's your legumes, your vegetables, your fruits. Seven, use of water. Are you well hydrated? There's no, there's no reserve tank on the back. The only water that goes in is the water you put in. Number eight, trust. Trust in divine power. These are the laws. These are the physical laws that are talked about in these verse. Trust in divine power. Trust in God. He is able. Jude 24, now under him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his Father's glory with exceeding joy. Incredible verse. He is able. He makes up our lack. Come to him. Give it to him. He's able. I'm going to now show you how these physical laws affect this. Where does our immune system start? With the skin. Do you know the skin is a suit of armor? And it protects the internal environment. <clears throat> because whenever it's cut, in fact, my little granddaughter, she told me that the ambulances were keeping her away at night. And I said, why? She said, they make these loud noises. And then I won't tell you what she said, but she gave an illustration of the Lord noises. I said, what are you doing? Blood, she said. Blood coming out everywhere. 
She's three. <laughs> That's where the ambulance is going. Maybe there's a car crash because when that skin's broken, what happens? The, it bleeds, but it also has opened the internal environment to anything that may be in the air. You can't see them, but they're everywhere. They're everywhere, these microorganisms. And as I showed you earlier in the week, they're nothing to fear. They're everywhere, they're everywhere. They're in our body. So what, we mu what must we do to that cut? And the children's story was a good illustration. Sometimes it has to be sewed together, doesn't it? But when our cook chopped the top of his finger off, they said, Barbara, he's, he's cut the top corner of his finger off. I said to Zach, where is it? And he said, in the compost bin. <laughs> Ooh. What's the first thing you must do? He's lost his arm up. And the nerve cells on the fingertip, whoa, do they feel? So we washed it very well. Isn't that common sense? You washed it very well. And then we put cayenne pepper on it. And you might think I'm being a bit cruel here. Doesn't it hurt? Well, it's already hurting. And did you know that cane pepper is a natural analgesic? So even, there, even though there might be a little initial tingle, some people might call it burn, <laughs> even though there's initial, when that settles down, there's pain relief. Praise God. And you know what that cane pepper does? Constricts those bleeding blood vessels. Constricts them. So, so I did it out of kindness, no, <laughs> and then wrapped it up. <clears throat> we kept it moist. We put aloe vera on it. Some, do you know that finger grew? In fact, you look at it today, you don't even... Yes, and the tip's still in the compost somewhere. <laughs> Incredible body we have. So this is a suit of armour. Am I there? It's like a suit of armour. It's your front line of your immune system. But let's go to the head and you'll find seven holes into that skin. We've got two ears, two eyes, two nostrils and a mouth. Let's start with the ears. So with the ears, I think we know there's an eardrum in there. So that stops anything trying to get in there. But there are also little hairs there. And there's also a bit of wax there so that if a bug or something gets in there, it gets trapped in the... Uh, wax so there's systems in the ear that protect the internal body let's go to the eyes eyes are amazing if something comes to hit it your bones will stop at going to the eye but if it's smaller and goes to the eye we blink in fact it's just a reflex and that blinking can often stop something going in but if the lashes and the blinking don't stop it, there's this uh, fluid around the eye that if it is a bug, it gets trapped into that fluid and often won't survive. And I think we all know if you get something in your eye, make your eyes go around the world a few times and it'll move it to the corner and you can flick it out. So there's systems in the eye to protect the eye. Let's go to the nose. The nose is where we should be breathing. We should be breathing through our nose and with our abdominal muscles. Because your nose does something your mouth does not do when the air goes in. Your mouth, sorry, your nose purifies the air, humidifies the air, and warms the air. That's what mouth, sorry, nose. <laughs> That's what nose does. How does purify the air. There's all these little hairs in there. So if you breathe in something and it's got a little dust on it, it'll be heavier than pure air. And so what it will do, it'll start shooting around all the little, uh, it's like little caves inside your nose. It shoots around them, ricochets around them, causing the dust to drop off and then the air is lighter and it goes into your trachea. And I think we all know there are two tubes in your throat. One tube is your trachea that goes to the lungs, and the other tube is your esophagus that goes down into your stomach. And when we swallow, it closes the tube into the lungs and opens the tube into the esophagus. What an incredible body we live in. 
Remember what that verse said? He has written his law with his own finger on every nerve, every faculty with which we have been entrusted. So it's important to breathe through your nose because when you breathe through your nose, you purify the air, you warm the air, and you also humidify the air. Just perfect then for your lungs. But let's say something still got in. Well, there are little hairs in your lungs. And if something did get in, what do we start doing? <coughs> Coughing, incredible reflux coughing, that's how you get it out. One lady said, Barbara, I'm coughing. I say, great. I said, it's got something to do with the fact that you've been smoking for 30 years. <laughs> there's a bit of damage down there. <laughs> and when there's damage down there, your white blood cells come to clean it up. And the only one way to get it out is to cough it out. It'd be nice if there was a little hole in the bottom of your lung and it'd just drip out there, but it's actually not the, not the, not the case. <laughs> so there's your lungs from the nose. And if someone says, but I can't breathe through my mouth, my next question is, why not? Well, it's all stuffed up. Why is it stuffed up? It's been stuffed up for years. Why? Is it because you have an allergy? An analogy is the most common cause of it being stuffed up here. So let me give you the five co common allergens. The five common allergens are peanuts, most people are aware of that, and dairy. Cow's milk's very good milk for baby calves. Not everyone has a milk allergy, but a lot of people do. And one of the signs that they do is they create a lot of excess mucus. The hybridized wheat of today it was hybridized in the 1950s and it changed the structure and so a lot of people develop allergies to that. Oats, about 30% of people that I meet have an allergy to oats. If you love oats, no reaction, eat oats. And refined sugar. So they are often the cause of too much mucus being in the eustachian tubes, your eustachian tubes connect your eyes, nose, ears, and mouth. And when, when that mucus hangs around for long enough, the person often will develop uh, sinus problems. So let's now go to the mouth. So in the mouth, we've got the only exposed bone in the body, that's called teeth. And there's nowhere else there are teeth. That's why when we looked at the gut, you need to chew, chew very, very well. And then we get down into the stomach and there's an incredible frontline defense of immune system there. It's called hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, if you put one drop on your skin, it'll burn a hole in your skin. But God in his wonderful wisdom and mercy has created this thick mucosa wall lining the stomach so that the hydrochloric acid doesn't burn holes in your stomach. But if you're dehydrated, your wall might be a little thin, so make sure you're well hydrated because the mucosal lining is 99% water. <coughs> Sorry, tea, coffee won't do it. It has to be pure water. Hydrochloric acid, most people don't realize, is antibacterial. It's antifungal. So if we happen to eat something that's got some bacteria or yeast on it, our hydrochloric acid will kill it. It'll wipe it out. Dogs have 10 times the hydrochloric acid that we do. I watched my daughter's dogs the other day. They, the, the neighbor had killed a calf because the calf was sick. And the dog, and he didn't bury it, so the dogs sort of pulled it apart and pulled half a leg into the yard. Oh, man. We had to get rid of that quickly. It was smelling bad. And the dog ate it, and the dog doesn't die. Have you noticed? Have you seen what dogs eat? Well, God must have already known it. Well, God knows everything. So the hydrochloric acid is 10 times what we are. That's why they don't die, because they've got this strong antibacterial, antifungal hydrochloric acid in their stomach. If someone says to me, I've got too much acid, I said, fantastic. It should be. But how do you know you've got too much acid? Well, it burns my stomach. Well, it shouldn't. 
Have you, are you drinking enough water? Have you got a nice thick mucosa wall there? Well, I know it's too much acid because it keeps coming up. The problem's not the acid, the problem's a little gate. We've got a two-layered gate there. So there's something wrong with the gate. Why would there be something wrong with the gate? Well, I know in America and Australia, a lot of people eat breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and the supper is the king and the queen together. They just say, well, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. Then when they lie down to sleep, gravity causes that meal to push, push against that little valve, weakening it. That little valve is a muscle. So when it tightens, it opens. If someone's stressed out and their muscles tighten, it can open. So then our front line, one of our front line defences is that hydrochloric acid. I think I was talking about this system. I think I'm losing this. Have I got voice? There it is. Let's go down our gastrointestinal track a little further. Our gastrointestinal track is a hollow tube. And anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances where it gets absorbed further on down. So let's go to the small intestine where it's lined with villi. And up the middle of the villi is a lacteal, part of your lymphatic system. Your lymphatic system is your body's vacuum cleaner. Over the villi and all through the villi is the blood capillary network. The Bible says in Leviticus, 1711 that the life of the flesh is in the blood the food we eat doesn't get into the blood until it goes through this wall and there's quite a process to get it through the wall lining the small intestine is a thick turf wall made out of our healthy or friendly flora or bacteria it's called lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacteria Oh, there's, there's actually millions of different bacterias and they all come from Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacteria. So that's lining our gastrointestinal tract. So why am I talking about that with the immune system? Let's say the person's hydrochloric acid was low and the bacteria got through. Well, there's another system. This gut flora is responsible for the final breakdown of our food. The enzymes in different parts of our gut do the main breakdown. They're responsible for the absorption of our food out of the gut and into the blood. Then it becomes part of us. But one of the reasons I'm talking about this with your immune system is the third function, and that is protection. If the bacteria got through the stomach because the hydrochloric acid's low, why would it be low? Because the person's drinking with their meal, watering down the acid. They're eating all day long, exhausting their glands that can't keep producing it. Or they're stressed out with the meal, which stops the hydrochloric acid. So it's got through. But that's all right. God's got another line of defense, which is also part of our immune system. It's the gut flora. But what if the gut flora is compromised? What if the gut flora isn't as it should be? What will happen then? We've lost our second line of protection. Well, what would cause it to be affected? Antibiotics. I'm not against antibiotics, they save lives. But what I'm against, and I agree with the World Health Organization that says the biggest healthcare risk today is the overuse of antibiotics. Antibiotics should be kept as life-saving. Not if you've got a sore finger. Not if you've got a little bit of a <coughs> cough. No, no. Because your immune system can heal you. It's the overuse of antibiotics. One man said to me, I've been on antibiotics for 10 years. Oof. His gut flora would hardly even be there. The human body can cope with a few courses of antibiotics in a lifetime. Did you hear that? In a lifetime. 
I raised eight children without any antibiotics and they're still all alive. Long-term painkiller use can, can eat it away. Refined sugar, that acid is such an acid it burns those little microbes. Also, statin drugs, many medications can compromise or break down this gut flora. So now we've lost our second line of defence. Before we show what happened next, how can we rebuild it? You will find in just about every country, traditionally, they always had a cultured food, whether it be sourdough bread, whether it be sauerkraut, whether it be miso, whether it be yogurts or kimchi. You'll find in every country there's some form of cultured food. Now that cultured food creates lactobacillus. So when we're eating those foods, it helps to restore this gut lining. But if someone has been on antibiotics, my suggestion is to supplement with a uh, probiotic. And it will take a couple of months to fully replace that gut flora. And you can buy powders. Ideally, you take it three quarters of an hour before breakfast, then it goes way down to where you need it. But let's say the person's gut flora is compromised and the bacteria gets into the blood. What, what happens now? Well, we have white blood cells. And I think most people see their white blood cells as their immune system. Yep. And we have, you might think I'm writing another language here, but I'm actually talking about you and your white blood cells. We have five different types of white blood cells. We have neutrophils, and 65% of our white blood cells are made up of neutrophils. We've also got lymphocytes. Lymphocytes is another type of white blood cell, and they're made in the lymph nodes, under your arm, in your groin, in your neck. So lymphocytes make up about 20%. Now the lymphocytes are the scouts. They're always on the lookout. And they're probably the ones that picked up this bacteria and they message through to the neutrophils, we need you. The neutrophils come along and they totally encompass that bacteria and they give out hydrogen peroxide, did you know that? That kills the bacteria. But in the process, they die. That's why a smoker, because there's a lot of damage in their lungs and the white blood cells have to keep coming and helping to fix it up, they're coughing up dark yellow or green. It's dead white blood cells. It's an amazing process. You've also got monocytes. And the reason why they're called monocytes is the, the neutrophils basically look like this. They're shady and they've got a whole lot of different nucleuses. Whereas the monocytes, they look like this, but they've got one, one nucleus. I used to do live blood analysis at Misty Mountain, and I've done hundreds of live blood analysis over many years, and it's easy to pick up the monocytes because they've got that one center, and the neutrophils have many. Whereas the lymphocytes, they're like a really hazy, hazy little circle with a bright light. I'll put some with a bright light in one corner. They're the lymphocytes. We've got also eosinophils. Eosinophils are a white blood cell that will be there in higher amounts when you have an allergy. The monocytes take up about 10%. The eosinophils only take up 2% and the basophils, they also, well, 3%, not very much. So what I found when I did the live blood analysis, I would look at the blood, it's against a dark background, so it's a dark field condenser, 
and the white blood cells light up. You can see them very easy. So you've got red blood, red blood cells floating around, then the white blood cells. So every blood I looked at, because it came up on the screen, should have about two eosinophils. Sometimes I'd see 21 eosinophils. And remember, these come in larger amounts when there's an allergy. So they would have about 21 eosinophils. So these are our internal immune system, but we don't want too much and we don't want too little. So sometimes when there's too much, it indicates a problem. So I would say to them, ah, you've got a lot of eosinophils. Can you handle dairy? No, I can't. Can you handle wheat? No, no, I can't. I'm celiac. So why am I seeing this in the blood if they don't even eat it? They said, oh, on the plane I had a little bit. <laughs> now they will be there until the next crop of white blood cells made. Now the eosinophils, they light up like a little bright light. And inside of them, they have a, a nucleus, but they have these little things. And when you look at it, the live blood analysis, they're all moving around. They're all moving around inside. They are histamine granules. And if someone's got an allergy and they go to the doctor, what will they be given? Antihistamines. Because it's the histamine that rises with an allergy. And the eosinophils rose when they were eating these foods. Their gut can't break it down, so into the blood becomes substances that cause the white blood cells to rise. If I saw someone with five or six eosinophils, that would indicate gluten sensitivity. If I saw someone with 10, 12 eosinophils, that indicates gluten intolerance. If I saw 21 eosinophils, that indicates uh, celiac, severe intolerance. So can you see that the blood reacts to these substances that are coming in? And many people don't realize that they have an allergy to wheat. It was changed in the 1950s. If you want to look at the story, Dr. Um, William Davis wrote a book called Wheat Belly, where he gives the story on what they did to the wheat. I think there are a few books that tell the story. And so I was looking at a lady one day and she had quite a lot of eosinophils. And I said to her, um, I see a lot of eosinophils. She said, yes, I'm celiac, but I like wheat, so I keep eating it. And I get diarrhea and I get rashes all over my skin. Mm -hmm. That's the body's reaction to this, this um, allergen in the body. And her husband, they were both about 35, and they came to our retreat because they were trying to have a baby and they couldn't have a baby. <clears throat> and I talked to them about getting these laws in place and eating proper food, <laughs> food that didn't get the allergic response. So I looked at his blood too. He had just as many. I said, oh, you've got high eosinophils as well. He said, oh, this is a load of rubbish. He said, I don't, have a, I don't get diarrhea, I don't get rashes. And his wife looked at him and said, yeah, but you fall asleep in the restaurant. That's another sign. Brain fog, falling asleep in the, in the middle of the day, bloating. So you can have 10 people with a gluten intolerance and there can be different symptoms in every case. Many people have it and they don't realise it. So... Eating wheat, eating foods that you're allergic to do, uh, can compromise your immune system. If someone has a cold, if someone has a fever or a flu, and you take, you take a, a blood test, all their white blood cells will be high. And people have said, my white blood cells are high. I said, yeah, that's just because you've got a cold. <laughs> I call them the soldiers. The soldiers are coming to fight the, fight the problem. <clears throat> That's the way God made it. I was, um, I was in New Zealand. And I was seeing a lady and she brought her little seven-year-old son with her. And the little seven-year-old son was standing there with a finger twice the size. I said, oh, what happened to that finger? She said, he has cellulitis. Well, 
You know what cellulitis is, inflammation of the cell. Well, we could tell that. I said, what are you doing? She said, he's on his second course of antibiotics. He's having painkillers and sleeping tablets to sleep at night, and he's seven. I said, oh, but what happened? Because you don't wake up with a finger like that. She said, he had a little blister. The blister broke, and he's outside in the dirt playing with his cars. So what's happening now? Is the arm has been broken. The arm has been broken and he's a little boy, he didn't think about it. And the dirt got in. You don't want dirt in a wound, do you? So immediately the body sends the ambulances, the SWAT team. What's that? That's the lymphatic system and it causes a swelling to try and prevent it going anywhere else in the body. It sends all the white blood cells and they start giving their life. So when I saw it, it was all red with white pus on top. There's all the dead white blood cells. Now that finger needs help. Often when we get an injury, the blood tends to sit and pool in the area. I said, can I try something? She said, please, we don't know what, we don't know what to do now. So this is what I did. And this not only brought healing, it also boosted the white blood cells. I put his finger in hot water for three minutes. You see, when you, and I'm sure we've all experienced being cold and have a hot shower, the skin tingles, doesn't it? Because when you apply hot to the body, it has a stimulating effect. It stimulates, what's it stimulating? It's stimulating blood to the area. And remember, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So we have to define blood before we go on. So what does blood contain for it to be life? White blood cells, we just looked at them, they're your internal army, and red blood cells. And the red blood cells they carry the oxygen. They also carry nutrition. The red blood cells also carry water. The red blood cells also take away waste. So when you think about it, if you have an injury of any type, what do we need? More blood. Did you know that nurses used to learn hydrotherapy? I have the nurse's textbook on hydrotherapy. But Ellen White says in page 127 of Ministry of Healing, she says the use of natural remedies requires an amount of care and effort that many aren't prepared to give. It takes too long. That's really sad, isn't it? But let me show you its power. So I put his finger in for three minutes. I put his good finger in first so that he's comfortable and happy with it the temperature. He put his sore finger in. Ow! So I'll put a bit more cold in. You've got to work with the person so they're happy with the temperature. So initially it's stimulating. So the initial is stimulating. And what are we stimulating again? We're stimulating blood. Because when the blood comes it'll carry away waste. It's going to bring water. It's going to bring nutrition. It's going to bring oxygen. But after three minutes, something happens. Slow down. Have you ever gone into a hot bath? You're cold and it tinkles, tingles. And after three minutes, what's happening? Ah. <laughs> Some people even fall asleep in the bath. So before it's got time to slow down, I'm going to put it in cold. Will cold wake it up? When we put cold water on the body, there's a reaction. And do you know why there's a reaction? Because we are warm-blooded creatures. And so when cold water touches us, there's a reaction. You've got to move fast, move fast, because if this cold stays too long, the whole body will slow down and they'll die. And that's why so many people died when the Titanic went down. They were in the water and their body just slowed right down and stopped. We're warm blood. That's why we don't like cold, do we? One lady said, Barbara, you say that I've got to listen to the body and my body says not to have the cold water after the hot. 
<laughs> and then I'll say, yeah, but how do you feel after the cold? So I put it in the cold because the initial effect of hot is stimulating and the initial effect of cold is also stimulating. The difference is that it only takes 30 seconds before cold gets from stimulating to slowing down. So I do hot for 30 seconds, I do so hot for three minutes, cold for 30 seconds. While his finger's in the cold, I put a little bit of hot water because I know he'll be able to handle more hot after being in the cold. I do this three times. He's just going into the third hot and a great big smile comes on his face. Why? He's got relief. He's got relief. <laughs> at the end, he's just looking at me smiling. How long does it take? I think a, a painkiller used in America is Tylenol, is that right? How long does it take for that to work? 20 minutes, half an hour? How long did it take for this to work? 10 minutes? 10 minutes, and he's got relief. And then I grated up a potato. I only grated up a teaspoon of potato. I wrapped it in a little cloth. We're going to be looking at how to do that tonight at 6.30. And then I wrapped it on his finger. I put a little bit of plastic over it to, to keep it, and then I taped it on. And then I asked him if I could pray. He said, yes, because I know there are many methods of healing, but only one that God approves of. And I asked God to bless his finger. The rest of the day, when I was chatting to his mother, they were there for about another hour, he just was looking at me smiling. Two weeks, or t ten days, he said. So when they got home at about two o'clock, he said to his mother, can we do that again? You see what happens, it was starting to swell again, so they did it again, a fresh grated potato. Then they did it again in the evening, and every time the finger was coming down a little bit more, a little bit more. In the morning, when the mother took off the grated potato poultice, the finger was totally back to normal, and when she took the poultice off, all the rubbish that was sitting in that finger came out. The whole thing had opened up. It was opening up a little bit more every time. She said, what will I do now? I said, I'll leave it up to you. Do I need to tell her what to do? That mother did not know what to do. She now knows what to do. And that little boy, for the rest of his life, he'll know what to do. He experienced it. No need for the antibiotics, no need for the painkillers, no need for the sleeping tablets. He had the best night's sleep he'd had since this first happened. Not only, not only did that little boy get relief with those hot and colds, but those hot and colds, alternating hot and colds, boosted his bone marrow to make more white blood cells. Just an incredible process. You can do it on fingers, hands, feet, hips. <laughs> We had a young man come and do our program. This is 10 years ago now. He was 14 and he was having accidents in his classroom from his colon. When he had constipation, he didn't have any leakage. When he had uh, diarrhea, that's when it leaked. Can you imagine how embarrassing that is for a 14-year-old? He'd already had an operation to that area which didn't help. You'd, you don't want operations to that area. So they decided to send him to our retreat. And I saw two problems here. One problem was he's got an allergy to the food he's eating because if a person has alternating constipation and diarrhea, something's wrong. And it's, it's usually to do with the uh, five allergens that I just stopped, just rubbed out. Showed me another problem, his anal sphincter is weak. So how do we strengthen that? Well, we had baths, sits baths. And 
every morning and every night, he sat in the sitz bars. I'm going to have to put the head around the 3%. Here's his head. With the water here. Hot for three minutes. And then we had another sitz bath where we did cold. Cold for 30 seconds. He's got a big smile on his face. <laughs> and he has got arms. <laughs> Every day we did that. How long did that take? Uh, 10 minutes. He had no leakages while he was with us. His colon started to work better. When he went home, I saw some tubs that you can sit in. He was about the size of me at 15, so he could. And I said, and I want you to do it once a day. It was too much for him to do it twice, so he just did it in the evening. And I said, do it 30 days without stopping, because every time you do it, it extends the power of the last treatment. So the second treatment is twice as powerful as the first. The third is third times more powerful. I didn't hear anything else. Sometimes we don't. Two years later, a lady that knew him came and she said, his stay here revolutionized his life. He is totally healed. Totally healed. So that alternating hot and cold to that little anal sphincter sent massive amounts of blood to the area. The blood feeds the nerves, the blood feeds the muscles, the muscle became strong. No more problem. So simple. Aren't you glad it is that simple? So how do we boost our immune system? Make sure you're breathing in lots of fresh air. Make sure you're exercising every day. Every day. If it's a blizzard outside, I'll do push-ups, I'll do stretches, I'll be on the rebounder. But you've got to do something every day, something to strengthen this body. Remember, we're training for something more important than the Olympic Games. Sunshine every day, sunshine stimulates your bone marrow to make more red and white blood cells. Temperance, stop the right refined sugar. Dr. Neil Nedley and his book, uh, Proof Positive, he lists how many white blood cells are killed with each teaspoon of sugar. The, the sugar just kills it off. Your immune system, you don't want to kill off your internal soldiers. Caffeine inhibits it. Alcohol is devastating to it. There are things that we should not take into our body if we're looking for optimum performance. Go to bed early every night. When you go to bed early every night, when you sleep those full eight hours, and if you want to explore that a little bit more, get the book Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker. When you finish reading that book, oh, the research in that book to show how devastating it can be for the mind, for the body, for your immune system when you are not getting enough sleep. Proper diet. Go to a plant-based whole food diet. It contains everything our body needs. Start drinking more water. Start early in the morning. So the rule of thumb is this, 50 pounds to four glasses. So 100 pounds should have eight glasses of water a day. That's a good rule of thumb. Try the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, love what you are and what you have. God says in everything give thanks. But my leg's broken. God says that we have to thank him. We don't understand why it broke, but we know that out of this we're going to learn some things that we possibly would never have learned if we didn't break our leg. Thank him for everything even if you don't like it. Because <laughs> when you thank God, you're, you're saying to God, stand it, I don't like it, I don't know what's happening. You're flying home tomorrow, but they cancelled my flight. So you know what I have to say? Thank you, Father. I left home on the 2nd of April. Oh, how I want to go home. <laughs> 
But you know what God wants me to say? Thank you that I'm not home yet. Thank you that I'm here. I'm on another flight on the 7th of November. I hope I can go home then. But you know what God says? Love the moment. Love today and be thankful for what you have. Yeah? Love where you are. Love who you are. Love it because it will change it. And then the Bible says a little bit further in the same chapter, so it's 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Prove it and you will see that it is good. So what can you do when you get a cold? Tonight when we look at natural remedies, there's a whole lot of little bits and pieces you can do when you get a cold. My daughter lives in Wisconsin. Her eldest son is a paramedic. He got COVID and he brought it home. So the whole family got COVID. Now my daughter, about five years ago, she cost her a lot of money, it cost her $16,000, but she said it's the best money she's ever spent. And it took her five years, I think, to pay it off. She's only just paid it off. It's a little steam sauna hut. And she lights the fire. And outside she's got a tub this big and this tall full of water. And in the winter she can't fill it with water until we light the steam bath or it'll freeze on the top. And so the whole family did the steam sauna every day. So this is uh, 10 minutes in the steam sauna, 30 seconds in the cold. If you can't bear 30 seconds, start with 10 and build up to it because you're going to do it three times. And they had some of the mixtures you're going to look at tonight, like the flu bomb, garlic, ginger, eucalyptus oil, cayenne pepper, lemon and honey. Yep, you drink it. Three days they were over it. And her husband is not, he's not very healthy. <laughs> he has a few health conditions. He's 50, 54, I think. He has quite a few health conditions. And you know that the current figures are that 99% of people that get COVID recovered. You know they're the figures. So the only people that really go down bad are usually people with pre-existing health problems. Well, he had major pre-existing health problems. He recovered in three days, two steams a day. What did they do when they were steaming? Move blood, more oxygen, more nutrition, more water, taking away waste more white blood cells, your internal army to deal with it. So when God says transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law, because God has written his law on every nerve, every muscle, every faculty with which we have been entrusted, and every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. The physical organism needs to be carefully preserved. How do you preserve it? You keep those laws. How do you develop Keep those laws. Start doing push-ups every day. Start exercising every day. We're training for something for more important than the Olympic Games. Know you not that they that run in a race run all, and one receives the prize? Therefore so run that you may receive. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We can be corruptible. I so run, but not as uncertainly. So fight I, but not as one that beats the air, I keep under my body. I bring it into subjection. If by any means when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. I trust after hearing this presentation, you will exclaim with the psalmist in Psalm 139 verse 14, I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works. <laughs> and that my soul knoweth right well. <laughs>